Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tanya Winders, President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, COVID-19 from Pandemic to Endemic. When we began the journey into COVID-19 in March of 2020, none of us realized how this would change the course of our lives. I don't think any of us believed that we would still be here in March of 2022. This webinar actually marks two years of uh, Allergy and Asthma Network addressing this concern and the global pandemic that has impacted all of our lives. There are still many things to be concerned about, and that is why we continue to bring you this content on a monthly basis. It helps to fulfill the mission of Allergy and Asthma Network, which is to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Again, I'm Tanya Winders, President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and we are pleased that you have once again joined us today. The webinar series is a part of Allergy and Asthma Network living out our mission, and since the beginning, we have brought you evidence-based information. Today, we are actually presenting our 35th COVID-19 webinar in the last two years. Today, we also welcome Dr. Purvi Parikh to the webinar. Dr. Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist immunologist at Allergy Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She is currently on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. She is passionate about health policy and serves on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Freak is the national spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network and frequently appears as a medical contributor to NBC, Fox, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and CBS. We thank you all again for being with us today and we look forward to hearing from you as we go throughout the program. There are over 1,300 people registered for today's webinar. And so again, we are going to make this interactive and look forward to having your um, engagement throughout today's program. So today we will cover the current state of COVID. We'll take a look at what the Johns Hopkins dashboard has to say, as well as the CDC data. And then we'll turn our focus to the vaccine update and how we are moving from the pandemic stage to the endemic stage. And what does that mean pragmatically and practically for those of us who are living with allergies and asthma and or caring for those who do so? So first, let's start with our very first poll of the day and let's launch the first one. Which category best describes you? Are you a physician, a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, nurse school nurse, respiratory therapist, asthma educator, or patient? So which category best describes you? We love that we get a multidisciplinary uh, team approach on each one of these webinars. And again, that we're continuing to get such a great turnout uh, for the webinars each and every month. Um, so we'll give it just another moment and we'll close the poll and share the results of who is around the horn this afternoon. All right. Looks like it, once again, we've got a pretty diverse group with 77% nurses, school nurses, 14% respiratory therapists, asthma educators, 5% patients, and 5% physician, PA, nurse practitioner. So a good multidisciplinary team approach in the house, and we love to see that. All right, so what is the current state of COVID-19 as we sit today on March 15th of 2022? So as you can see here, this is the COVID-19 dashboard by the Johns Hopkins University that we uh, rely on for the latest data. And you can see that we have now surpassed the 460 million total case mark, and that we're still seeing a 28-day case rate uh, quite high with uh, 46 million reported uh, cases over the last 28 days. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing the death toll continue to rise now with over 6 million deaths due to COVID-19. And the vaccines continue to rise as well. So the total vaccine doses administered 
uh, again, now reaching well over 10 billion vaccines throughout the world. So um, this is a wonderful resource that again, we use on an ongoing basis to track what are the trends in COVID cases, in COVID mortality, and in vaccination uh, dose administration. And then when we look at the CDC data, remember the CDC data does tend to lag behind the Hopkins data just slightly. But what you can see is that um, in the CDC data, those darker blue states are where the case rates are higher at this time. We have almost 80 million reported cases through CDC with over 7,200 uh, new cases. And that seven day case rate per 100,000 is now at 71.9. Um, so again, the, the numbers and the concentration of impact of COVID-19 continues to vary from month to month, but what we see is, is definitely um, no state or no part of our nation has been spared from the impact of the pandemic. Now, what about when we look at the headlines, what is in the news? Uh, first, there is a new study that links accelerated aging of the brain and other changes to even mild cases of COVID-19. And this is a really fascinating study that shows that there could be that reduction in gray matter of the brain. And many of those changes um, could be related even to that sense of smell. So very fascinating that we're seeing even mild cases of COVID um, which have long-term implications and health concerns for patients. And then next, the U.S. mask mandates are certainly lifting very rapidly as we go throughout the, the, the weeks and months. Um, the CDC has suggested that most Americans do not need to wear a mask at this time. However, there are some exceptions. So about one third of school districts continue to have a mask mandate in place. And Hawaii is the only U.S. state not to lift its indoor mask mandate um, as you know it is expected to be lifted later this month but in fact is the only one that still has that mask mandate in place Furthermore, um, we're seeing that even some of the early symptoms of COVID-19 and mild breakthrough infections is, is, rep is being represented by a sore throat. And so that new, newest variant appears to be present in the US. This is the Delta Cron, which is a combination, uh, a hybrid of the Delta and Omicron. And hybrids are rare, but there's uh, no current evidence that the mutations spread as easily as Omicron did. Remember, we saw much higher infection rates with Omicron, um, that spreadability was much more evident with that variant. And thankfully, in this Delta Cron, we're not seeing that evidence of, of such fast mutations. But the symptoms may appear a little bit differently. If you remember in the alpha and beta cases, we often saw that loss of smell as the hallmark uh, early symptom. And now it tends to be um, more along the lines of the sore throat and um, other symptoms that um, mimic oftentimes a respiratory virus. Now, when we look at the CDC case rates by day, the new cases by day, again, you can see that we had such that high spike in the December, January, early February timeframe uh, with Omicron moving across the US. And thankfully things have leveled back out significantly or much lower in the new cases by day uh, here as we enter the first half of March. Now let's go to our second poll question, and that is, where do you go for most of your information about COVID-19? Is it the media, TV, news, websites? Is it social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and the like? Health organization websites like CDC or your professional society, um, even Allergy and Asthma Network's website would qualify there, and then maybe your personal doctor or healthcare provider, and then finally your family, friends, and neighbors. And again, we know that there could be more than one answer, but where do you go most for your information about COVID-19? Um, and maybe you say, you know what, Tanya, I am uh, just tired of hearing any information. I am over COVID. I think many of us could um, definitely 
um, empathize with that COVID fatigue. And yet it's important that we continue to stay attuned to the latest developments. And I applaud each of you for giving some of your time this afternoon to do that with our webinar. So let's go ahead and close this poll, share the results. Looks like we do have diversity, but certainly those health organization websites is the number one answer with over 80% and then media coming in um, as a, a distant second with others following. All right. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Parikh for a vaccine and COVID-19 update. Dr. Parikh? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I, I definitely understand the pandemic fatigue. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, we will um, you know, move on to the vaccine update. Um, so this has been a quite historical undertaking to have so many individuals vaccinated. Um, but we still have some ways to go. 216.7 million in the U.S. are now fully vaccinated, and 96 million have uh, received their booster dose. Um, and as you can see on the slide, kind of the breakdown of uh, vaccination rates by age. And as you can see, 65 and up tend to be doing the best in terms of, um, you know, vaccination. Next slide. And then this is another great map um, that also gives an idea of uh, vaccination rates by state um, in case, you know, you are traveling and you want to know wherever you're going what the, you know, local vaccination rates are. So there's a lot of great resources. This is from Mayo Clinic, um, but CDC has uh, this regional information as well. Next slide. So very uh, common questions so that, you know, we, I get asked frequently, can you still get COVID-19 if you're vaccinated? So yes, you know, the, these vaccines are not 100% effective at preventing infection, but people and people who are fully vaccinated will get COVID-19. Um, but, you know, and I, I hate the term vaccine breakthrough because it seems like it's a failure of the vaccine, but actually, the point of the vaccine isn't to make you bulletproof. It's basically to make you so you're not the target. So the vaccine will save your life. It will keep you out of the hospital. Even if you get a milder illness, it will make you sick for a shorter period of time. And there's studies that now confirm it will make you spread it less as well. So uh, again, this is not uh, a failure of the vaccine. Infections will still occur, but at least it will prevent a lot of the very uh, severe outcomes of infections. And uh, speaking of long haul COVID, um, there's data that now shows that vaccinated individuals are less likely to develop those long haul symptoms. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to get the vaccine. So to answer number two, um, yes, please get it if you haven't yet been. You know, it's no longer experimental. Um, both uh, two companies have full FDA approval of their vaccine, and we now have over, um, I believe, 4 billion individuals on the planet vaccinated. So, you know, the safety and efficacy data is there. Uh, how long do COVID-19 vaccines last? So, you know, the antibodies can wane over time, and monitoring these levels is one way to measure efficacy. But that being said, it's only part of the picture, and I wish you know, uh, the media and just in general, people will be focusing on the fact that there are other cells that, uh, such as T cells, that actually remain immune for much longer. So even though antibodies may wane after six months uh, for Pfizer or Moderna, we've actually shown uh, data that the T cell immunity, which is even more important in my opinion, because that's really what protects you from landing in the hospital and dying and getting very sick, that actually has stayed strong even through all of the new variants and everything. So again, um, this isn't that straightforward of a question. I think it actually lasts much longer than, uh, than we assume you know, based on just the antibody responses. And how long is the stability of the Pfizer um, COVID-19 vaccine? So they've uh, submitted that, you know, this one has to be kept very cold at two to negative eight degrees Celsius. Um, but it actually um, can last now we, that we know for one month in the refrigerator um, before we were thinking that, you know, it could only be stored at those sub-zero temperatures. Um, and that made obviously cold chain issues and storage and administration difficult. But um, now luckily there's data that it can um, be in a normal refrigerator for at least a month. Next slide. 
Um, so, you know, if you had an allergic reaction to your first COVID vaccine, will you have a reaction to a later vaccine? So not necessarily, and it's uh, recommended that you get evaluated by a board certified allergist uh, to determine if the second shot is feasible. Um, I know for me personally, many of these uh, patients that get referred, many are not even true allergic reactions. So many can get that second shot. So, um, you know, please get evaluated properly. And so that way, you know, if it's safe for you to go on and get the second shot. Um, and luckily, now we have many options uh, so that there are different types of vaccines you can take, or other um, options as well that will protect you. Um, will the vaccine help me avoid long COVID? So yes, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, are there lasting mental health issues? Um, yes, absolutely. With COVID, you know, um, COVID patients are more than 60% likely to suffer mental and emotional issues a year after infection. Um, so anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, um, drug and alcohol use and concentration problems. Um, and is there another variant out there after Omicron? So there have been, there's a BA2 strain of Omicron that spreads 30% more easily, and it, it is accounting for about 4% of the new COVID infections. Um, last week, some news broke of something called Delta Cron, which looks like it has features of both Delta and Omicron, but so far it hasn't been marked as a variant of concern because it's still very low levels. Um, and we're not seeing increased severity or transmissibility, but there will always new, be, be new variants, you know, and that's normal. That's uh, um, how viruses survive. They keep mutating. The thing that we don't want is a more severe or contagious variant or one where our vaccines are not working as well. Um, so the Pfizer CEO in the last few days said a fourth dose of vaccine is necessary. Um, so, you know, I, I would take that with a grain of salt. I, I personally haven't seen the data yet. It's just been um, submitted to the FDA. And it is possible that the COVID-19 boosters will be annual like the flu shot. So variants are coming. And we know that the duration of protection doesn't last long. Uh, he also said that they're working again to make a vaccine that will protect against all variants, but also offer protection for a year. So is that second booster necessary? And this is where, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced, uh, just based on the, uh, the CEO's comments yesterday. I think a four shot is necessary for certain individuals right now. So it's already being given to immunocompromised um, folks. And we may find that recommendations may be on the horizon for, let's say, elderly or other chronic conditions soon. But I think for the most part, um, for healthy healthy adults and teenagers, we may not need it as frequently, you know. So again, we need to see that data because even with three doses, the protection is very good, you know. And as I mentioned, it's still very good against a severe infection. So um, the rationale behind the fourth dose is to kind of avoid infections in general, which I understand because the less infections and the less new variants, but um, it's when, you know, and for who. So eventually we all will need another one, but it's, the question is how frequently. Um, cardiovascular issues related to COVID. So uh, there have been reports of serious um, cardiac and cardio cardiovascular issues, 4% um, higher in the 12 months after people were diagnosed with COVID-19, um, higher risk of stroke, heart attack, arrhythmias, um, also inflammation of the heart. All of these things have been reported, um, and I know there's a lot of issues, uh, uh, talk of this happening with the vaccine, but it's actually much higher with the actual virus, almost 37 times higher. So it's still in your best interest to be vaccinated um, to prevent a lot of these issues. Next slide. So pandemic to endemic. Uh, so this is hopefully you know the end in sight that we all are looking for. So just a short history of pandemics, you know, 1918 was, was the last big one, you know, and then we had swine flu mo the most recently uh, in the last 10 years. It was nowhere to this scale. But eventually these pandemics do move, do pass on and do move on to endemic. And we're hoping that, that we are starting to see the start of that right now. Next slide. So a pandemic is when this occurs over a wide geographic area, affects significant proportion of the population, and there is very widespread growth uh, and what we call these surges, you know, and 
you know, then resources are strained. Um, you know, at, there's a very high rate of infection. Endemic is when it kind of becomes um, the surges stop. The infection doesn't go away, but it becomes native, you know, uh, to a particular region. Um, but it's not as widespread, you know, across the globe, across all uh, regions. And uh, then, you know, hopefully the surging and that strain on the resources is far less too. Next slide. So the pandemic will become endemic. Unfortunately, this virus is not going anywhere. Um, and, ho and as larger numbers get immunity, hopefully there's less transmission and um, less COVID-19 and death. That's the end goal. Um, we already have good data that as of a couple weeks ago, over 70% of the US population now has some immunity to Omicron. So hopefully that combined with the vaccines will help push us more towards this endemic status. Next slide. So transmissibility, uh, you know, it's it's hard to determine. Um, viruses spread when there are enough susceptible individuals and enough contact amongst them to sustain the spread. And it's hard to identify exactly when it will become endemic. So this is a kind of a dynamic situation, but the strength and duration of immune protection is important. Um, and that's why we are urging vaccination so much because even though natural immunity is you know, still a factor, we know that it, it's not as durable in everybody. So we, we need the help of the vaccines to move to that endemic status. And that's what we've seen in other um, pandemics as well. Um, it's been hard to get population immunity with COVID-19, uh, which is like similar to what we call herd immunity when enough of the population is immune. So it's hard for the virus to spread. Um, the vaccines offer strong protection, but, you know, uptake has not been, it's been great, but not as great as we want, want. you know, there's still millions, even in our own country that are unvaccinated and, and many around the world that haven't even gotten access to the vaccine. Um, so that's a problem. And then as the virus spreads, it continues to mutate. Omicron did bring us closer to this herd immunity since so many people were affected. Um, and, you know, many experts now see COVID becoming endemic like the seasonal flu, you know, and, and endemic is also a sign that it doesn't disrupt your everyday life, but like the pandemic does, did. So again, you know, kind of what we went through, you know, pandemic, you'll see waves, the surges, endemic is more seasonal, um, you know, won't be as disruptive, hopefully. And will we need more booster vaccinations? So a lot of these questions, you know, time will tell. And uh, like everything in this pandemic, we're, we're learning as we're treating it and as we're navigating this course. And more about boosters, you know, what extent will COVID-19 evolve to evade our immune systems? How long does protection last? last and what burden of disease are we willing to tolerate in a population you know what do we want to do about preventable diseases so again we'll see we'll see how uh, things evolve um, and you know a lot of the policy decision making will be uh, tailored around that and public health measures of course so what about masks will they have a place in our approach to preventing transmission you know i i think masks are somewhat here to stay especially in the winter months similar to much of the other parts of the globe, like Asia, it's, it's very routine uh, to mask in public transport in certain um, high transmission zones, you know. Um, again, this will vary based on your local regional rates, the time of the year, that's, that's where that seasonality comes in. And the individual, I was talking to um, uh, Sally before we started this webinar, and I said, you know, even if airplanes get rid of masks, I may continue to do so, you know. Because I feel safer that way. So again, we'll have to t tailor to our own individual needs and risks, um, and and the season and time of the year. And again, endemic doesn't mean harmless. As we know, um, endemic diseases like TB and malaria can kill. Flu kills people every year. So we still have to, you know, be aware of it and not necessarily live in panic, but at least be prepared. And we have the tools to do so. And, but we should still be optimistic. We have, we're in much better shape than we were two years ago. 
We have vaccines, uh, we have great therapeutics and wonderful public health measures. And I'm hoping this will be a way for new innovations to prevent uh, future pandemics. Um, and, you know, this is a great quote, you know, I'm encouraging people just to hang on to these mitigation measures like masking, distancing for just a few weeks. And you may even want to indefinitely, right? Because it, these are all good hygiene practices that we likely should have been doing even prior to the pandemic, every flu season, for example. Um, so let's see what happens. Warm weather is always good in terms of viruses, less spread. We'll see next winter, there may be another surge, you know, similar to how flu seasons can tax hospitals. Maybe this will, COVID will as well every year. Um, and then we'll keep an eye and see how the U.S. is, uh, especially late summer, early fall, is proven to be a predictor, especially the South, of what will happen to the northern states as, when, as the weather cools. Um, and then past pandemics have also led to massive changes in how we live life. So, you know, I don't think we'll ever be normal, normal again, but at least we can come to new normal, you know. Um, you know, screens on doors, better um, to keep, you know, mosquitoes out, sewer systems, access to clean water to help eliminate typhoid and co cholera. And maybe we'll learn some good lessons to minimize disease spread in general and have better global health. All right, so with that, uh, I'll go to the next poll question. What topic would you like to see us present on during future pandemics? I have a future webinars. Hopefully no more future <laughs> pandemics. <laughs> this uh, series, you know, we are committed to continuing to respond to the needs that the community raises. So we want to know from you what are topics that you would like to hear about if we, as we continue um, the COVID webinars. We, We'll continue to do this as long as uh, thousands of people continue to show up um, like they have even today. And so we just really want to continue to tailor this to what you want to hear about, what is relevant to you. And um, I see that about 30, 40 percent have voted. So go ahead and cast your vote and we'll share the results here in just a moment. And then please go ahead and begin to put your questions in the question pane. Um, of the control panel. We'll get to as many of those as possible here in just a moment. So we'll give it just another second. We'll close the poll and share the results here. So not surprisingly, 60, greater than 60% want to hear more about long COVID and its impact. Uh, we know that millions are suffering from long COVID, and this is a special area of interest for both Dr. Preek and myself. So we will respond accordingly with that. Next is medications and treatments. And again, we know that different variants respond to different medications and treatments. And so uh, we'll continue to bring you the latest information there. And then vaccines and preventative measures and questions and answers from listeners. Um, we always love that Q&A time. We learned so much uh, from the questions that you pose each and every webinar. So with that, let's continue on. I think now is the time that we come to your questions, and we do have several that have already come in today. So the first one here, Dr. Parikh, is the CDC publishing metrics on what levels of community transmission would lead to reinstatement of which mitigation measures? So are they sharing with us specific metrics to watch for community transmission in the days to come? Yeah, so they're looking at hospitalization numbers, you know, deaths, because that's a good indication of, if, you know, your health system is strained, that means transmission is high, um, but also uh, like numbers of infections as well, but it's, it's less of a focus now, if that makes sense. They're looking more at the severity. Um, so a combination of everything, but they've shifted a bit to the severity. Okay. Uh, the next question, how are vulnerable populations being considered in this transition, i.e. Uh, people with immune, compromised immune systems or those that are on uh, chemotherapy or, or going through other um, immunodeficiency treatments? Yeah, so I mean, I think obviously vulnerable populations need to be considered more so. I, I haven't seen a huge I'll be honest, um, policy move in that direction outside of recommending, you know, the fourth booster for 
uh, this population, you know, if you're five months out from num shot number three. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think, unfortunately, more policies have to consider this group. Uh, I, I think not enough has been done to date. But I know for my own patients, I've been, many have been requesting, you know, certain accommodations like working from home or uh, transportation accommodations to help mitigate their own individual risk. So that's always an option if you fall into that category and are having anxieties about returning to work or otherwise. Great point. And, and very necessary for our community because, again, there are so many that have those underlying chronic conditions that, they're, um, it, that are impacting their both physical health, their mental health, and you know, their concerns about the lifting of um, these restrictions. Now, our next question comes from Kathy, and she says, I have heard, read that Pfizer is working on a new booster that may actually have protection against new variants. Do you know if the trials are ongoing for this and when a new booster may be available? Yep, Dr. Preet. Dr. Preet's computer froze, but she's getting back on as fast as she can. So she'll oh. be with us in just a moment for the question. Sounds so good. One thing yeah. we might want to, after the last poll, this is Sally Schessler for, for uh, those of you listening, uh, Director of Education at the network. Um, one thing when everyone was saying they really wanted to hear about long COVID, on April 28th, we already have a webinar planned for long COVID, kind of the whole new picture of it. Uh, we've certainly had some, some uh, picture of it as it's gone along, but we're gonna have kind of some fresh perspectives and Dr. Preek will be speaking on that webinar as well. So, uh, so at that point, now I'll go back and lurk in the background again, but she should be back on in just a few moments. Sounds great. We'll give her just another minute to get logged back on. Um, this question from Brenda, do you think in the future we'll get COVID vaccines every year like we do the flu? You know, Brenda, I think that it's likely. Um, to be honest, as we move into this endemic state, uh, I think that it's very likely that we'll see different variants and similar to the flu, we'll have a, a new variant or a new strain of vaccines each year, um, at, at, you know, as we're two plus years into this, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, as you heard from Dr. Parikh. Um, Dr. Parikh, are you back on? All right. So do healthy pregnant people count as immunocompromised? Should they consider a fourth dose? And how soon after the third dose? So Healthy pregnant women are not considered immunocompromised. Um, however, we are advocating, and, and most OBGYNs are advocating, that they get the third booster. We have not heard, I've not heard specific recommendations around a fourth booster for pregnant women at this time. Um, but if they were recommended a fourth dose, generally that would be within six months after the third dose. Well, Tanya, this is Sally again. I think too, it's super important for uh, pregnant women to uh, discuss their their treatment with their physician because uh, different doctors may have different opinions, but also everybody's uh, situation is so unique that it's really valuable to uh, make sure that you're checking with your own physician to figure out what's best for you. And now I see that Dr. Parikh is back on. Hello, sorry about that. My uh, computer froze, so I had to restart it again. I no. apologize. So <laughs> this question is perfect for you, Dr. Parikh. Can you talk more about the potential T-cell benefit? Um, she, Michelle says since it says stay strong, the T-cell benefit. Yeah, so what, what the, um, you know, viruses actually, uh, there's different parts of our immune system that help us fight all infections. And uh, T cells tend to be the best thing to help us fight viruses, even more than those antibodies that everyone talks about. So the good news is that these vaccines have made our T cells very immune. And, and that immunity is lasting longer, actually, than the antibody immunity. So the, and that's important because um, we believe that these T cells are what really protect us 
from, uh, you know, very severe disease, uh, death, hospitalization. And we found out early on in the pandemic, those patients who did worse either had low numbers of T-cells or their T-cells were not working as well. They were we called T-cell exhaustion. They were wearing out more quickly. So, so having that immunity is, is um, very helpful. Okay. And can you please also update us on the status of vaccinations for kids under five, Ashley asked. Did we lose Dr. Preek again? Dr. Preek, I believe your line is muted. Oh, hello? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry, I was I was muted. Um, so what uh, for under five, I think it's coming very soon. Um, I know Moderna is submitting uh, data shortly they have different dosing than pfizer um pfizer if you remember um they had submitted data for under five and what we found was that for two and under it was very efficacious but unfortunately in the two to five age range it was not you know so so that was the problem so i don't know why they had kind of submitted it for the whole pediatric age group. If I were them, I would have at least gotten it approved for the um, younger infants because that data actually looked very good. So now Pfizer is testing a third dose because I think the dose was just too low for the older toddlers, uh, you know, and those who are probably three, four years old. And then hopefully that data is promising and then they'll be able to resubmit. Um, Moderna, I know, is, is also planning to submit soon um, for, you know, all the child age groups. And it looks like hopefully they'll just be a two-dose vaccine. So again, it's good to have options. And, and that's what we've been saying, you know, since day one, that I'm glad that so many different vaccines and vaccine platforms are being studied for this very reason. So in the case that one proves to be not as efficacious, we have other options on the horizon. So I'm hoping in the next couple of months, fingers crossed before fall, we'll have something for the under five age group. Yeah, yeah, I, I do as well. I mean, I think that the more we have those options for our pediatric population, um, again, the, the more likely we do move into that endemic stage and we see um, people protected more broadly. Now, the next question comes from a school nurse who shares that their school district is following the Wash U school nurse algorithm, but it's becoming increasingly difficult with allergy season because the symptoms do overlap. And most of all, the COVID testing is negative, right? So what are your thoughts, and maybe Sally, you weigh in as a former school nurse, on still using an algorithm during this significant drop in COVID cases. Do you think that that should still be the route that school nurses take? Yeah, it is. I agree, it is difficult. And even as an allergist, it's difficult because it is, you know, we are seeing a lot of people coming in with their normal uh, symptoms. Um, I think the algorithm may have to shift a little bit. Um, the, the testing is helpful to do. I think if, you know, uh, if individuals are vaccinated, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, and if there's someone who's prone to regular allergies, it may, the criteria may become more narrow, I think, and, and relying more on things like fever or uh, upset stomach or other symptoms. But I agree, it's, it's very challenging. I think it's going to be very challenging for the next few months to navigate that. Um, and I don't know what the best answer is because an unvaccinated individual, especially kids who tend to get milder symptoms, it, it can be very almost identical, the symptoms. So um, it, it's another tricky thing that we have to navigate in this pandemic. I, I'd be curious to hear Sally's thoughts too, though. Well, uh, first of all, I totally agree with you, Dr. Parikh. But also, you know, the, the value of an algorithm is, is you know, uh, and, and you know, obviously we work a lot with, is it asthma or is it COVID? And if you're looking at that question, uh, then an algorithm is incredibly helpful because then you're going to look at viral symptoms uh, of the fever, the sore throat, uh, that, those kind of symptoms versus the, the breathing symptoms. But we're certainly always going to see children present in our health offices with shortness of breath. And, and that is going to probably be a challenge for quite a while to come. But I would simply, you know, try to go through the, you know, the question of is it viral or is it is it asthma and, and work with that 
And then, um, but you will have to decide as a school district also, what's going to be your policies for uh, asking a student to go home, uh, calling a parent and saying, you know, I'm concerned this might be viral. I mean, certainly we didn't send home every child, you know, uh, that might have, you know, sniffled in the past, but, but it has become more important to look carefully at symptoms. So I would say, you know, talk, make sure you're getting, uh, direction from your school district, but then also really work hard to look at the difference between asthma and viruses. Thank you, Sally and Dr. Preek. So our next question comes from Justine. Is there specific data that's needed to move into endemic status, uh, i.e. like a positivity rate that has to be below a certain threshold for X amount of time? Um, that's a great question. So it's not a necessarily um, positivity rate, but we do want to see infection rates lower, you know, than 2% or 3% in most regions. And again, we're looking at those surges, right? We want to see how strained the local healthcare um, system is. And remember, endemic may not be the whole country at once. So the virus may be endemic in New York, but not in that endemic status in another area or another region where they are seeing surges and the hospital systems are overburdened. So um, it, it's not an exact criteria, but generally it, it's when the resources are not strained, you know, it, it's more seasonal and it's not disruptive to daily life as well. Yeah, very good point. And, and again, Think about in your very local community and the way that those resources are uh, being stretched and, and uh, certainly tune in to your local authorities to get some direction on kind of where you sit in that overall um, status of pandemic versus endemic. Now, the next question uh, definitely comes from our school nurse community, and that is during the pandemic, we were told not to use nebulizers in the school setting. Um, do you think that it's still that, that we should still follow that recommendation or should we um, open back up to using nebulizers? Yeah, so I think again, you know, it depends on a lot of factors. The things that I would look at and that what we look at in our own office when the decision to go back to nebulizers is, you know, vaccination status of um, all the individuals involved so you know uh, the staff the students um also you know if the nebulization can be done in a well ventilated area um that also is a you know positive in the in favor of it and you know i think that it, it's a useful tool but remember nebulizations are usually done in an emer like an emergency situation right this is not a medicine that should this should not be something that's done all of the time so uh, again, encourage students that if they are sick to not come to school in one, for one, so that will reduce the urgent need of nebulization. But it is required, you know, with sports, with other factors. So hopefully it's not frequent that you would need it, but th those are the factors that I would consider on whether or not it's safe to bring it back. And of course, local infection rates as well. Yeah. So the next question comes from Lizette, who says, should, when should a child get vaccinated if he or she had a recent illness to COVID? So when, if, is it necessary for them to get the COVID vaccine? And if so, when? Um, yeah, I, I would still recommend it. And so does um, the CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics. And the reason being is that, you know, natural immunity, it's, it's very variable person to person, uh, especially if it's like a milder infection, it may not last as long. Um, so I would say when the child is feeling better, uh, you know, it's not an immediate rush, but at some point they should uh, receive their vaccination and, and then they'll really benefit because they'll have the best scenario, which is hybrid immunity, where they'll have, you know, some natural infection, and some vaccine, uh, some natural immunity and some vaccine immunity, both. Yeah. And, you know, this is a really timely question because here we are coming up into the spring allergy season. And we know so many of our asthma patients also have allergies. Do you have any specific directions for those that are on the line living with allergies and asthma for this spring particularly? Yeah, I would say, you know, start all of your preventative uh, and controller medicines like now before it gets very bad, because then 
by keeping your allergies and asthma at bay, uh, it'll be so much easier to uh, distinguish. Um, you know, you won't have the conundrum. Do I have COVID or do I have allergies, you know? And also it actually, believe it or not, will make you less likely to get very sick with COVID. So if you're on your controller medicine, there's a lot of good data now for your asthmatics that the inhaled uh, corticosteroids prevent um, more severe forms of uh, COVID-19 by keeping your airways clear and not inflamed. And same goes for um, other um, medications for your sinuses. So, you know, nasal sprays or antihistamine, oh, excuse me, all of that is very important. So start it now and, and you'll have a much easier time in the coming months, I think, from both standpoints of allergies and the virus. Oh, and get vaccinated, of course, yeah, if you haven't say, been. controlled <laughs> asthma status is the determination for if you do get COVID, that, that risk of complication. So the, you know, the more you can do today, as Dr. Freak is suggesting, to control your asthma and allergies, the more likely, even if you do contract COVID, you're not gonna have those complications. So great uh, response there. Our next question is, is there any data regarding post-COVID cardiovascular morbidity um, in, in, in general populations, but also in non-professional athlete, athlete populations? Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So there is data that um, there is inflammation uh, that can persist, uh, cardiac inflammation, so in, and in very healthy athletes, too. I know um, the question was non-professional uh, athletes, but the, um, most, the study that comes to my mind is actually in college athletes, who I think are some of the fittest individuals around, right? They're young, they're healthy. They're in good shape. Um, so, you know, that in itself, I think is a good reason, reason enough to avoid the virus if you can and to get vaccinated. Um, now, once you're vaccinated, those the heart inflammation and all inflammation is far less, even if you do get COVID-19, right? Because sometimes it is unavoidable. So um, the data does show that even though that cardiac inflammation occurs, if you're vaccinated, it occurs to a much lesser degree. Um, and um it, it's it's hard to know so if you're somebody who is an athlete some recommendations are that you may want to get additional screening so that's something that you should discuss with your physician or if you have other comorbidities that put you at higher risk for heart disease in general so diabetes obesity high blood pressure then you should consider getting extra screening if you've recently gone through a covid infection just to make sure you know all um i's are dotted and t's are crossed yeah. Now, this next question comes from Renee, and she says, uh, and there's actually several questions that follow this same thing. Is it possible that our infection rates have decreased because there are fewer um, in hospital or healthcare facility tests done where, you know, now we have the home test and those positive results aren't necessarily always reported? Uh, it's, I mean, it's possible. Um... The home tests, you're right, you know, it's self-reported, so not everybody reports it. But also, I think the state, the states and uh, local regionalities also keep track of how many people are, um, one, coming to the hospitals, you mentioned ERs, urgent cares. So all of those rates have decreased significantly. Um, also, the again, that strain on the healthcare system is telling, too. So even if people get at-home tests, inevitably people may progress right and need to seek medical care whether it be as an outpatient or inpatient and we're seeing far less covid cases coming in on both sides on um, the inpatient setting and outpatient setting so it, it goes on more beyond just the test because um, anyone who interacts with a physician who has covid symptoms will be getting a covid test so the sign that less people are coming in to be seen is also a positive and i know per just from personal experience during Omicron, uh, you know, we were getting inundated even just by phone calls, right, about people getting sick think with uh, traditional symptoms, and we're not getting those phone calls anymore either. So that's another good sign that, you know, that, the, again, the medical system isn't being uh, consulted for that reason. Yeah. So a question that comes here from Monica, have you seen any information about serious or long-term side effects of the COVID vaccine now that we are more than a year out from those original vaccinations? Yeah, that's a great question. As, as we get more data, we understand the long-term consequences better. So the good news is that um, 
overwhelmingly, there does not appear to be serious uh, long-term side effects. There are, you know, very rare serious side effects. So again, anaphylaxis being one of those, but statistically, it's super rare. You're more likely to be hit by lightning, actually, to, than to get an anaphylactic reaction to these vaccines. So that's one. And then even the other ones, such as the myocarditis, um, Guillain-Barre, the very rare blood clots, those are all also uh, exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Um, and to the point where, again, so many other things are much more frequent. Um, I, I use the getting hit by lightning as an example, but the, it is the same frequency even with those very rare blood clots. And the irony of it is that many of the very rare serious side effects are much worse should you actually get the virus. So the myocarditis risk goes up 37, per, uh, 37 times in unvaccinated versus vaccinated. The blood clot risk, some studies show, go up 20 to 30 percent, excuse me, in unvaccinated versus vaccinated. So even if you do get one of these rare side effects, it's far worse um, if, you know, you don't get the vaccine at all, if you just get the actual virus. Because the long-term risks of that are far worse, in my opinion. Um, now that I'm treating a lot of COVID long haulers, I can see it. I, I'm seeing far more people with side effects from the real virus than the vaccine itself, if that makes sense. And also, overall, most vaccines luckily don't have surprise side effects five years down, 10 years down. Most we discover you know, within the first year or two of the vaccine rollout. And thankfully, we haven't seen that with the COVID vaccines. Now, the next question is a really interesting one and one that we have actually gotten at the network quite a bit. Um, it's from Karen, and she says, I know several people who had COVID and are now having hair loss. Uh, how long will this hair loss last? Uh, will the hair regrow? Any good resources that maybe you could point us to on why that's happening? Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, there's so many weird phenomenon that are unfortunately occurring um, in people who have COVID and not just hair loss, but all the long haul symptoms we spoke about earlier. Um, the short answer is we don't know why, especially the hair loss specifically, but anytime your body is in an inflammatory state or a stress state, and that's what we believe is happening with long COVID, um, we believe that there's just persistent inflammation long after the virus is gone, um, you know, or the virus is contagious. Um, and, and that can cause hair loss, even from other reasons. It can cause hair loss, it can cause weight gain. We've even seen, you know, people develop diabetes post-COVID, other neurologic issues. So um, again, this is a perfect example of the, um, yeah, the long-term consequences being far worse, you know, with the actual virus than the vaccine and it being better to avoid it altogether, you know. Um, so the best resources I would uh, see your look, uh, you know, a good board certified dermatologist because they're experts in hair loss and I'm sure they're seeing a lot of this. So they would know best how to manage it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Dr. Freak. I also think that, um, you know, there are, um, COVID long haul treatment centers out there that specifically if you're suffering from those kind of symptoms, you may want to explore and have a conversation with a specialist in that area as well. I think we have time for just one more question and I'm gonna take this one from April who says, do you believe that there'll be a possibility of having like a two in one vaccine that addresses both COVID and flu in the future? Um, yes, and actually it's already being studied. So trials are already underway for combination vaccines. Um, so that will be great because then hopefully it's only once a year that we need both and you can get both at once. You know, already pharmacies are offering both on the same day. Um, and, you know, it's completely up to you. I, I prefer spacing it out just because I reacted very strongly to the COVID vaccine. But uh, you know, as our bodies get used to it, you know, maybe it will be in the future. But the studies are already underway, so it may be available as soon as next year. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate you answering that so timely. And I just saw a question that I think is extremely timely, and I'm going to ask it, even though I said that was the last question. So this question comes from Hope, and you know, all of our attention certainly um, in the U.S. has been has turned to the Ukrainian crisis. Do you believe that that crisis may affect 
COVID because of the 3 million refugees that are being welcomed into other countries. Oftentimes, you know, COVID protection has not been their priority. And in fact, there's been reports of lower vaccination rates among the Ukrainians, do you think that this might we we might see pockets of surge as a result of the Ukrainian crisis? Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question. It's, it's definitely possible, um, especially given the factors that you mentioned. So if there's low vaccination rates, you know people are being grouped together in tight quarters. You know people are under stress, right? So they're more likely to fall ill. It's definitely possible. Um, you know, only time will tell, but hopefully it's it's less of an issue as we move into the warmer months. You know, Europe as well is moving into warmer months. So fingers crossed that doesn't occur. But, you know, it's it's just like everything in this pandemic. We're going to have to wait and see yeah. and hope there isn't something. That's right. We just keep our eyes and ears open, keep listening and staying tuned. And with that, I do want to thank Dr. Preek for her expertise today. We always appreciate your insight um, and, and the way that you so practically share your expertise. I also want to thank each of you for listening today. Um, you continue to show up. You continue to join us. You continue to challenge us with your questions, and it is so helpful in developing the content that means the most to you. Um, I also would like to invite you to our next webinar. Um, it will be on March 24th, where we'll look at sublingual immunotherapy, single versus multiple allergen approach with Dr. Moises Calderon. You can register for both of these webinars on our homepage at allergyasthmanetwork.org, um, where you can always scroll there to the bottom of the page and register or view our webinars. Also, I want to encourage you to stay on the line for two to three minutes, complete the evaluation. Uh, and once again, thank you all for joining us. I'm Tanya Winders on behalf of the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We can all breathe better together when we address the important issues of COVID-19. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.